Welcome to Interplay, Conversations in Music, with my special guest today, Jerry Junkin. I'm Michael Shapiro. Hi, Jerry. How are you, Michael? And <laughs> everyone. Good to see Thank you. you. Good to see you. Now, for those of you who do not know the wind ensemble world like I do, I do want to say a few things about Jerry Junkin. Um, I first met Jerry Junkin when he conducted uh, John Carigliano's Circus Maximum, Maximus with the University of Texas at Austin's uh, Wind Ensemble, I believe it was, Correct. at Carnegie Hall, a little place down on 50, West 57th Street. Now, Jerry, you are a distinguished professor, I believe, university professor at UT Austin. Right. Mm -hmm. You're also, we've worked together in this capacity as the music director, conductor of the Dallas Winds. Right. And you are also a, a guest artist, I think, of high position with a Hong Kong wind ensemble and a Japanese wind ensemble. Actually, the one in Hong Kong, I'm the music director, the artistic director and conductor. And in Japan, it's uh, and that group in Hong Kong is a professional group. But in Japan, it's I'm affiliated with Shinzo Kugakuin uh, College of Music. Uh, so I'm a visiting professor there. Thanks for saying that, because I wasn't going to try. <laughs> but uh, I'm assuming you're missing everything at this point. Is the university opening soon or not? Do we know? Well, in one way or another, it will open on August the 24th, but it remains to be seen, you know, what that's going to look like. Uh, and I just l late, well, yeah, last night talked with my colleagues in Japan about Things are canceled there for a while. You know, every, everything is canceled everywhere. Had a phone message from Hong Kong this morning. So, and in Dallas, of course, we're all in the same boat all around the world. So no one is alone in this. Quite clearly, I know all of my engagements are, quotes, postponed until later, uh, through the tr end of this year. It's, it's, it gives exactly. us time to work at home and to think of literature, in my case, writing and studying. But in your case, how have you been, been spending the time? Um, you know, it's been a mixture. And I, I've been asked that uh, a lot, obviously, because it's and for I would say the first two to three weeks after this all began in March going into April, I was nervous and antsy and feeling like I was supposed to be on a plane and I was supposed to be going somewhere. And I had this uh, stack of scores that's now out of camera range, but to the side, which was all the scores of the upcoming concerts, you know. Uh, so, so there were two in Dallas, one in Austin. We had just finished a concert in Austin on March the 6th. That was our final concert before the crisis, the, the pandemic hit. And so um, I had another UT concert, two in Dallas, one in Hong Kong, you know, engagements during the summer. So all that stack of scores, I would like to tell you I was really industrious and I've, you know, was delving into more music, but that stack of scores is sitting where it was. Uh, and, you know, the programs that have been planned for the coming year are either being postponed or canceled. So there's just nothing imminent right at the moment. So I would like to tell you I've been, I've been memorizing all these pieces that I know I'm going to be, but I don't know when I'm going to be able to do them. So I've been catching up on a lot of stuff. Our house looks great, I have to tell you. So, <laughs> I think everyone's house looks better. And hopefully, phys ph hopefully physically we, we look better. I know a lot yeah. of people are walking, getting out, doors, yes. especially this summer, you know. Right. Um, we went through a rather crazy time here. Um, and you and I have both could share experiences uh, of uh, bouts with this disease, but we will pass on that and talk about music. I'd like the to only know. Thing I'll say about that is that you look great. You know, uh, considering well, what you've been through. Well, my hair, my hair is just as long as yours. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm curious to talk to you about the future of band music, wind ensemble music in the university. We're making a great, and then go to to the professional life you have because you do both. Sure. Um. We're going through a period now of waiting for Godot, as it were, waiting for the vaccine. Wind ensemble work is very similar to choral singing because mm -hmm. people are throwing out droplets all over the place. If you would have a season of some sort at UT Austin, although it sounds like Texas is going through phase 
One, just the approach to the mountain that we in New York went through in March and April, and I can speak from bitter right. experience. But let's assume you get back in some way. I'm, I'm sure you've been talking about it among the university professors in the music department. How would you deal with this in that sense that you, you, you conduct large groups of people en masse? Right. And would you have to break it up? How would you do it? Yeah, I think that's, and, and yes, I assure you we've been having constant conversations about this, which are getting ready to become ratcheted up even more now as we get closer. But um, for us, we've made the determination that we cannot in any way continue business as usual uh, in this fall. So the group that I normally conduct, the Wind Ensemble has a flexible instrumentation. So whatever the composer requests, you know, from eight players to 75 players, whatever the specific instrumentation is, just there are no large ensemble pieces that we can do because of social distancing, the number of people in the room and all of that around the subject of aerosols and how they're dispersed into the air, which we're waiting on a couple of important studies that are being done right now about aerosol, air displacement, uh, dealing with all of the woodwind, brass and percussion instruments. And those, we should have some results from these, in a way, twin studies that are taking place in Colorado at the University of Colorado and Colorado State, separate uh, studies. But those, within the next week or two, we should probably be getting some results about that. But I can't imagine that the results will tell us, oh, sure, go on, do whatever you've been doing in the past. That's just not going to happen. So I think right now, what we can, the best that we can try to do is provide chamber ensemble experiences for our students with appropriate social distancing and other precautions like maybe plexiglass between players, things like that, spreading out much more and probably in the fall for no audiences. We've made the decision here at UT, no audiences. Maybe we invite a few faculty members in to hear their students play and but spread them out in the house. But we may be able to live stream or webcast chamber concerts, but that's the, that's the closest approximation we can make uh, to music making, you know, and, and doing it virtually, at least in my book, and, I, and I'm not dissing anyone who's done it, but, you know, putting together these Hollywood Square sort of Zoom uh, performances for me is of no interest. Uh, and I'm, I'm waiting to see more than one or two good ones, you know, so. You well, know. yes, it, it's, a, it's, a, it was something people have done from the BBC right. to here, but it's, it's not what we used to. Let's right. talk about that pile of scores. Yes. Uh, you and I are, quotes old enough to remember a time when there were not many new scores for wind ensemble slash band. There was a huge literature, obviously, for orchestral writing. When I was studying and coming up in, the, in this whole world, um, other than the Persichetti pieces, Percy Granger, I didn't really know very much. Uh, you know, you knew right. Goldman, but the Goldman band was here in New York and they would do things, they do arrangements often, but I wouldn't have any knowledge of it. So apart from the fact that I love band directors because you're open to new things always, what do you got? What are you doing? What are you, yeah, you, well, you know, I think that interest in new music is what excites me about the profession and the field. And um, you, you asked me a moment ago about the future of the wind ensemble. I didn't really answer that question, but I think for me, for someone like me, there's never, and I'm including the time we're in right now, there's never been a better, more exciting time to be involved with this medium and to be a, a conductor because there is so much good music that is being composed right now for the medium, which you couldn't say that 15 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Um, I, there's a famous quote of Arnold Schoenberg's in the 1940s in which he was a, approached by G. Shermer about writing what turned out to be uh, his theme and variations, Opus 43A. And he said, oh, bands, you know, no good music. All bands play are transcriptions, novelty, no, sorry, marches, novelty numbers, and transcriptions of music of low taste. And that was it. That was the that was the band repertoire. That's a difficult um, quote quotation. Yeah, he had, uh, his notorious sense of humor was shining through there. Wow. But at any rate, it, 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 he was right. 
Um, but now there are so many composers of all ages too. And it's not just a generation of new composers. I mean, it's, you know, the most wonderful composers such as yourself are right. You know, uh, John Corleano and not only him, but in, him, him encouraging his students, um, you know, rest his soul. Christopher Rouse was a wonderful contributor and fan of the medium. So it just, it, the, I shouldn't even name names because it, the, the line goes on of people who are now interested in the medium and producing really substantial amounts of wonderful repertoire. Well, you know, I don't know if you know, but after the premiere of Circus Maximus, uh, we went out with John and family. Uh, you were not there because I think you must have been with the kids. Right. And all John was saying, and it hit me hard, was they were really well rehearsed. <laughs> I, I never get that. Right. <laughs> it's an interesting comment. You do have the luxury, which we don't necessarily in the quotes professional world, as you well know as a professional conductor, of having more than one, two, three, four rehearsals if you're lucky. Four is the max. Yeah. Oh, way out there. Well, with a, with a, how many rehearsals did you have for Circus Maximus? The first. Well, that's it. I mean, to be honest, not as many as we should have, um, just because of some complications from the publisher and the the parts and all that sort of stuff. But John met his deadline beautifully. I had a score finished, completed score in his hand by October first of that year. Performance. The first performance was in Austin on February the sixteenth. So the idea was we would have all of the parts so that we could actually rehearse before we let out on break. That didn't happen. So the, our first real rehearsal was on the Wednesday following Martin Luther King holiday of that year. So that was January the 22nd, something like that. Uh, so to be honest, we probably, we, we still had with a couple of extra rehearsals, we probably had 10 rehearsals, but that was for the entire program. So not just Circus Maximus, but for the other you know, three pieces on the program as well. But still, it was it was quick. And what we were doing to get people music that they could look at over the break was we were cutting out of his C score, you know, parts and just like <laughs> making one line and just faxing them to people because this is before, you know, we could do it purely electronically. So um, at any rate, so at least they had something in the key of C to look at. Uh, so that when they came back and could actually get their hands on the parts, we could really begin in earnest. But Tim, Where, is that, that's a long answer to your question. No, it's a great answer. It's comprehensive. Mm -hmm. um, but still, you know, I've been with him and been on my own on the road many, many times where we do not get sufficient rehearsal. Sure. And how can people know the style? How can they develop into the music under the notes? It doesn't happen right. so easily without a lot of recitation. Unless you're dealing with, like I deal with uh, the BBC, you know, National Orchestra of Wales recent recording where it's a recording orchestra and they do a lot of radio and television. So they're really fast and they, and they, right. they seek to get under the notes really quickly. So we can start a piece in the morning and record it very soon thereafter and they've never seen the music. That's rare. Right. I've conducted other professional orchestras. That's not the case. Um, and the deep rehearsal program is good. Let's talk about, again, that stack of scores. I guess it's mm -hmm. intriguing to me. It's now a stack, and it could be many hundreds of scores big if you right. let them go that way, and you probably get besieged, I would think. Um, do you have any sense of a few questions? First, where would you like it all to go? Or, And... Are there instruments that people should not be writing for in the context of wind ensemble? Meaning that well, schools might not have them. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting thing. I always, when I'm talking with composers, if we're starting a project together, a relationship uh, to, that's going to culminate in a piece, and it's, it's the, the object of the commission is to write a piece for our group, then I never want to put a restriction on someone, you know? So I just want them to write the piece that they want to write. And then we'll figure out a way to accommodate that. Um, but there are, uh, you know, if, if a person is concerned and, and most composers are about future performances, then I think the overuse of 
they're not exotic instruments, but let's just face it and say expensive instruments. So having three English horn parts or having two contra bassoon parts or, you know, things like that, adding a, a, a string complement that goes beyond this oddball one double bass that we almost always find in wind ensemble pieces, but which you can always hear. So, um, you know, it's quite interesting the fact that there's, if, if a double bass makes a pits, it, how that cuts through 50 woodwind brass and percussion players, I don't know, but it always does. Um, but if you wanted to use cello, if you wanted to use, involve a solo viola or something, then in an academic situation, you've got to work it out with the orchestra and conductor if you're sharing players and people are meeting at the same time. So um, if a person is concerned about future performances, then I think nothing too outlandish in terms of giganticism, you know? So uh, you, there are, of course you could use bass saxophone, you could use sopranino saxophone, but once it begins to get beyond the standard four or five, then you're jeopardizing future performances, even though that first performance might be spectacular. Now, John with Circus Maximus, that was a great example because he wrote for, you know, this, huge collection of trumpets and all sorts of specialty instruments but that was a specific piece and as gunther schuler once said you know what if you want to do my piece you'll figure out a way to do it so or not right but, so we shouldn't be writing for serpent these days right i doubt it yeah. <laughs> okay unless it's mendelssohn um but getting back to the first part of the question any thoughts and you must have them of where would you where would you like to this all to go from a compositional standpoint what would you like to see you know i just think that bands should be viewed by people and i would hope that this is where we could go that everyone would be view bands and wind ensembles as being a part of the real world of music and not this aberration over on the side that does weird things and sort of has their own language and, you know, but um, if, if the leading composers of the time are writing pieces that represent their best work for the wind ensemble medium, I would consider that a success and a victory. And it's certainly happening right now, but it's not, um, it's, and you know, because it's more and more difficult for large symphony orchestras these days to commission works maybe in the way that they once did, um, bands are doing very well, but you don't want this kind of hybrid repertoire to grow that doesn't have a relation to what that same composer would be writing for a symphony orchestra or a very elite chamber ensemble, something like that. This is something I that, that I learned. Sense. No, no, no. It makes total sense. And this is what I recently learned past 10 years in writing for, for wind ensemble, for band. It's a completely different discipline. You cannot go upon it thinking that you're a orchestral writer and you're just going to transcribe for band. Band has its own sound, timbre, combinations, the string bass being heard above 50 other instruments. That's acoustic. That's no, it's acoustic. It's totally yes. acoustic, and the lack of a of a string bass, you can hear that. You don't get cer a certain a, attack or feeling with the, with a the band that you would get with including in a wind ensemble, including that string bass. Um, I always love seeing the string bass on marching band fields, you know, standing <laughs> standing by the side while everybody's doing all that fancy footwork. Right. Yeah. But do you, do you address with composers if they should send you a piece that you say, it's not quite wind ensemble music. It sounds like re-orchestrated, rearranged orchestral music. Are they not facing what is endemic to the right. writing for just wind instruments? Well, that's, a, that. that's an interesting, yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting thing because if you take just the subject of transcription, you know, by itself, which has been a part of the wind band repertoire since the 1700s, we know that. Um, but when, when a work is transcribed, then there's two things that can happen. You can view that as, okay, somehow, for whatever reason, we're wanting to make this wind ensemble sound like an orchestra. So we're going to orchestrate the wind version in such a way that you think you're listening to a symphony orchestra. Or you can approach it 
to make the transcription so that it sounds like it was always intended to be this wind ensemble piece and it's convincing musically. So there are just two different ways to look at it. So I think a composer who writes orchestral music exclusively or largely, for that composer to then come into the wind band medium, I think it's probably not the best way to view it to say, okay, normally I would put this in violins. What's the best show? So that means it should be clarinet here. Or I think you just have to come sort of wipe all of that away and know that you don't have this big string complement. So now you have to embrace, you know, the colors that are uh, available to you in a wind ensemble. And one of the things that happens is the there can be overuse because of doublings in a wind ensemble. So That's I think right. the more specific a composer can be about the numbers of players they intend, the, the better it is for everyone, for the composer as well as the performers. That's why the early Persichetti pieces like the Vertimento was so revolutionary, I think, because Vince, I, you, know, I, you know, I'm his student. I knew Vincent very well. He was my friend. And I miss him every day. And I know that he approached that piece, because we discussed it, with the sound of the wind ensemble in his head, orchestration-wise, and also right. creatively, organically. I want to switch to something else which I find fascinating, because, as you know, I, I'm a professional conductor who sometimes conducts in the... Uh, university world as a guest. I've done residencies all over the place, including at your school. And I've seen you conduct rehearsals and performances of the UT Austin Wind Ensemble, if I get the name right, mm -hmm. and the Dallas Winds. Hopefully someday I will travel with you to Japan and Hong Kong. I would love that. That would be but nice if we got to do that sometime. <laughs> let's do it. I would love it. But let's talk about approach. When I've conducted professional orchestras here and in the uh, UK and Wales, um, my approach has been very different than if I'm conducting at Texas Tech or wherever. It's very different. Can you speak to that about how you approach a rehearsal with Dallas Winds versus UT Austin? You don't have to mention names, but I'm just curious. You know, I think there's actually now, and maybe every year that goes by, there's less difference than there was at one time. Uh, and one of the things that has caused that difference is probably because since I've been involved with the Dallas Winds and my work in other places, having to put things together quicker has, has changed the way maybe I would pace a rehearsal at UT as well. Um, and also, it's, it is a little bit difficult for me to talk about because just this year, we were in the midst of our first year of a new kind of rehearsal pattern anyway here uh, that we were trying out. So um, it's almost it's difficult to sort of go back in time and, and make that relation. But I could I knew that I could be more expansive. I and I'm not just saying I could blab more. I could talk more, but I could go into more storytelling about uh, maybe background of the piece, or if I had felt that I maybe had been pressing a little too hard and the pedal was on the gas a little bit too much, I could I knew that I could take a half of a rehearsal or something to ease back a little bit and maybe uh, bring some levity to the situation, to ease some tensions, whatever. Whereas, you know, in a professional situation, the, the culminating event is the concert, which is going to take place in a rehearsal or two rehearsals or three or four rehearsals. It's interesting. I'll, I'll never forget this comment, but we had done a concert here at UT on the next, it was on a Sunday. On the next Tuesday, it was executive committee day. And so I'm sitting there in the meeting room and uh, one of my colleagues who'd never paid attention to anything is on the other side of the room. He was a great guy. He always had a book in front of him, you know, so you never knew whether he was listening at all. One of my other colleagues walks in the room and as they're going by, they say, hey, Jerry, great concert on Sunday. Man, it was really good. I loved it. It was so professional sounding. And this other person sort of raised his head up. And said, Why would you assault him like that? What do you mean pro professional? You mean a little under rehearsed, a little out of tune? A little bit, yeah. It was way better than that. You know, it was way better than so, I mean, sometimes the having that luxury of more expansive time, obviously, um, you're you're able to get to a deeper level that happens in the professional world once pieces become repertoire pieces 
for for an orchestra or maybe the second or the third performance of the four night run whatever it is at a certain point and i've talked to so many musicians and orchestras who say this that they don't really feel like they get it until maybe the third performance yeah. And that's a luxury in academia we don't have. So it's a trade-off. You know, you have more rehearsal time, but fewer performances. Now, you are, you're active again in both spheres, the mm -hmm. professional world, which is a world largely ruled by money and aesthetics. Right. And you're dealing also, you're working in the academic university world, which is really aesthetically oriented. But there are grades and there's expectations and there's growth of young people and everything. I have private students who I am teaching at various levels and I teach at residencies and colleges. And one thing that I found as a composer is that what I'm learning in the lessons, I'm imparting to my students, but also it's infiltrating to a certain extent what I write and how I write. Do you feel what you learn in either sphere has cross currents? Are you learning things from both and how specifically? Oh, yeah. yeah, I, I, I'm, I will, I hope that I will never reach a point where I feel like I've got this, you know, I mean, I'm constantly viewing myself that I'm learning things, you know, whether it's dealing with students, I learn a lot from my students. I love the teaching aspect of it. I would, I would never want to give that up as a trade-off for the other. I, I adore it. I love my conducting students. I love the students who are performers, the whole situation. I'm, I love my colleagues. So I'm very, very fortunate in that way. Um, so I try to keep the students at the forefront of it so that when I can transfer something and I don't want to like big time people say, well, let me tell you, sitting on an audition panel, that would never, you know, all of those sorts of things. Yeah, forget that. So, but if there's something that you can transfer from one to the other, it's all you're hoping to do with students is save them some time anyway, right? You know, that's the best thing you can do in, in some but, ways. But, but to be specific, because I always search for the specific, what are you taking from teaching the students and bringing to the professional situation or vice versa? Can you think of anything? Yes. Uh, and I think uh, some things transfer, some things don't. The, um, okay, let's just uh, talk about one specific part of it. This is the worst part of the job if you are a music director in a professional situation, and that's the dismissal process. Terrible. Mm -hmm agonizing for everyone involved. It's agonizing for me, it's agonizing for the musician involved, clearly, but the players committees and all this stuff. It's a terrible, long, protracted thing that no one enjoys, no one wants to go through it. But for the health of the group, you have to, you have to make these decisions, you have to do it. And if you just put it off and wait too long, it's ultimately, it's not good for the group, et cetera. But dealing with students, that's different. What if a student is just having a hard time coming up with it. And maybe they have performance anxiety or there are things going on in their lives that are keeping them from, um, from preparing at the highest level. Not to get in their business, but I wanna know what's going on with them. So I'll have a different kind of a conversation with a student than I would with a professional because with a union involvement, you have to say to a professional, Here's what's, here's how you're not cutting it. This is what is unacceptable. Maybe I will say it to a student, but I'm going to say it in a much kinder way because I want to know what's going on with them because I know that they have potential. They wouldn't have been accepted in to an elite music school without someone seeing that potential. So if there are family things, maybe I can help with that, you know, what it, whatever it is. So it's, it's a way of dealing with people and dealing with the situation. Maybe, one informs the other for me. Dealing, dealing with people. It's, that's what yeah. we do. Exactly. Final question before we go, and this has been delightful. Thank you. What? This is quick. <laughs> I'm curious about conducting, teaching, conducting. Yes. Me too. <laughs> well, I studied with Carl Bamberger at Manus, and I studied with Harold Farberman uh, at Bard. Very different. One was all about aesthetics and his his relationships with Bruno Walter and Fritz Wengler, and the other one was purely technical. How to hold a hand, how to snap it down, and wrist conducting versus arm conducting versus standing versus... 
One thing that I've learned, however, is it's not my conducting the music. It's the music telling me what to do. And the gesture is tied to what's in the music, not vice versa. And right. it's what I'm telegraphing to the players. So I've never seen you teach conducting. I'd love to see it one of these days. What do you strive for? And you must have, diff of course, different levels of student. But in the most advanced, what are you, what are you trying to show them? Right. And the, I'm again, I'm very fortunate because we have a program that I, it's limited in size. There are never more than five graduate students at a time. I have no strictures that are placed upon me to accept, okay, that means two of them have to be masters, three doctorate, you have to have this formula. Every year I just accept the best conductors who apply. It doesn't matter what the level is of degree or rather which degree they're going for. And then we end up with five really great people and it's on, if it's working correctly, it's on a rotational thing where like one person graduated this year. So one is coming in and then the next year probably two will leave, you know, so it's constant like that. So I'll just tell you, I have great students because we have a lot of interest in the program. And so we're able to be really selective about it. So with the graduate students, we will focus in a seminar sort of situation where they are conducting the chamber group and I'll make comments with them. We'll review video, et cetera. And then when they're working with the large ensemble, on a piece that's going to be performed on a concert. And there's at least one of those on every concert where the, a graduate student is conducting. Those conversations usually I'll have outside of rehearsal as a review. So I'm not dealing with them right there in any way that would sort of affect the way the group uh, looks at them. But uh, that's a long way to say, I don't accept students who have technical problems. So the technique, if it's worked out, it has to be worked out before they get here because there's so much to do in terms of depth of knowledge of the pieces that they're conducting that there's no time to work on pure technique. Now, I will make technical suggestions. I'm not saying I don't ever talk about that, but someone who maybe is a brilliant musician but is coming to this late but who has technical issues, I don't feel like... I, that's not how I want to spend my time with a graduate student in conducting. Do you think it's an old man's game? Are hmm. you better? Are you better now? I hope so. I think <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I, I would. I yeah. I to be honest, it's look. I'm 63 years old. It's taken me till I was 61, probably, to where I would be able to say out loud, "I'm good at my job." You know, well, the, there's always all of this, you know, it's like you're not nice. People aren't supposed to say things like that, but I'm not as good at my job, hopefully, as I'm going to be in two years and four years. And, you know, you just keep getting better all I of think, your I life. think there's a depth, yeah, to learning, which takes a lifetime. Yeah. And, Jerry, this has been wonderful being with you, even across the uh, It's always the good continent. to see you. It's good to see you, too. Everyone, thank you for joining Michael Shapiro, your host on Interplay. And to my guest, Jerry Junkin, be well, be safe conduct and enjoy life. Be yes. well. Bye-bye.